very much for bringing us here today to be able to gather in your name and in your word, Father. I just ask this morning for your Holy Spirit's presence to be amongst us, to dwell in our hearts and our minds, to give us wisdom and understanding and guide us into all truth, Father. And I uh, also especially pray, Lord, that our Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted up in today's study and ask these things in his precious name. Amen. Okay, so this week's lesson study is mainly uh, the Sabbath and, of course, uh, living the character of God because uh, they actually go together. Uh, I'm going to start with the memory verse. Uh, memory verse is found in uh, Mark 2, 27 and 28. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So I'm just going to read from the bottom of Sabbath afternoon's lesson. Well, it's not really the lesson. It's just the opening, obviously. Uh, Sabbath had been an opportunity for education and personal development. It's an interesting story about how we can think of the Sabbath as not just a day of rest, but as a mean of ed means of education as well. Um, I think that puts it pretty plainly, right? Uh, but we're going to talk more about what the Sabbath exactly is supposed to be, what it is for us, what it should be for us. Um, and I think one of the biggest things as, yeah, I'm going to say as Adventist, um, when it comes to the Sabbath, is how we keep the Sabbath. You know, uh, it was never an issue, it's never been an issue back in the time of Jesus of whether they kept the Sabbath or not, but how the Sabbath was kept. So oftentimes, you know, as Adventists, uh, maybe we might tend to get a little bit, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, where you become legalistic. And, you know, like the Jews back in the day would do the same thing. They would take and put all these things on the Sabbath that, you know, were man's own inventions and ideas of what was acceptable to do on the Sabbath and what wasn't. And so I think, honestly... Uh, when I say this, is that uh, a lot of Adventists today even, you know, we, we, we don't have a real set of rules other than what God tells us on keeping the Sabbath. You know, so it's like, well, what can we do on the Sabbath? What can't we do on the Sabbath, you know? What really is the meaning and the purpose of the Sabbath? So, um, and feel free to comment anytime. You know, I'm just throwing comments out there. Um, so, we're going to jump right into Sunday's lesson study, and uh, it's entitled, Time to Be Astonished. Um, so, we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 and 2 particularly, uh, and uh, I think we're pretty familiar with Genesis 1 and 2, especially uh, concerning the Sabbath, on what and when the Sabbath was established, and what was the purpose of God establishing the creation for Adam? So back to the, the heading, to be astonished. Um, so if you did your lesson study, <laughs> what, what would you say would be some of the, I just, if you can give me a few comments or input, what would you say would be some of the things that would have been so astonishing about the Sabbath? Now keep in mind when we read Genesis 1 and 2, we read about the creation and in the seventh day, you know, culminating at the end of the seventh day, uh, man created on the sixth, and on the seventh day, everything that God had made, man had to look at and observe to see God's character. Uh, what would be some of the things, so I'm going to ask that question again, what would be some of the things that uh, would be so astonishing about this seventh day that Adam was put in at the end of creation. What were some of the things that you would say would be things to be astonished about? I'll give one. Uh, the opportunity to walk with the creator of the universe and talk with him and learn from him. I think that would be astonishing. I mean, I couldn't even imagine if Jesus or God the Father was in my presence. I mean, as he is, you know, he's here with us today in spirit, obviously. But 
to be able to, to be with God and speak with God, I, I can't even imagine what that would be like. So yeah, the heading, time to be astonished, I think that's one of the great things. What would be something else? That well, we know that they'll keep the Sabbath in heaven. Yes, so yes. we assume that there was a Sabbath kept prior to this creation. It would only be logical that we're keeping it during the creation and after uh, the second coming. So to True. me, Sure. You know, we have this commonality uh, of belief. And so I, I suspect in heaven, it's, it, it's a continuation uh, of, of what we should be doing here, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to be keeping, the Bible tells us we're going to be keeping the Sabbath, right? Throughout time, throughout all time. Why? Well, because it's a memorial of God and his greatness and what he's done for us, right? But as you mentioned, also a time for fellowship, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Everything with God is about our relationship with God and with man. What's the Ten Commandments about, right? Well, it's about that very thing. There's millions and millions of people in heaven. I mean, maybe our fellowship is special during that time. Maybe his presence is, is greater. Maybe the, the feeling of his presence is greater in heaven or on the Sabbath, so to speak, than it would be during the day. Because maybe we're off doing things, you know. Building our, house, our mansions. Do, you know. Yeah. We're not building, but building. We're all going to know we're created beings. We're in heaven. I mean, it's, it's not like we have, to, you know, we're, we have a job and we forget that we're created beings, sort of like we are here. Mm -hmm. Sin has taken over our, 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 our thought process. But to me, up there, it's, it's, I think it's going to be more of a, a, a Jesus draw, or God drawing more near to us, maybe, teaching us, you know, giving us a, it's going to be a special day for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would think maybe also maybe less distractions than what we have here. Maybe, or maybe we'll be so astonished by everything that's go going on. I mean, it's going to be something completely different. You know, the Bible says I have not seen, you know, what God has in store for us, right? Um, but yeah, so some of the other things to be astonished would be in the creation process. I mean, look at all that God did in Genesis, right? He starts out creating the heavens and the earth, light, animals, Right? And at the end, with one of the uh, greatest things I would think, you know, when man was lonely, he creates a, 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 a well, the Bible calls it a help meet, right? He creates woman on that, on that day right before the rest day, right? Um, I would imagine Adam looked up at the stars in the sky and just contemplated and imagined. But you know what's interesting when you think about it, too? Imagine what... You know, Adam wasn't like a regular baby, of course, you know, that had to learn. He was fully grown when he was created, right? And he also knew, and I believe that God probably taught him a lot of things. I mean, think about his mental capacity, too. You know, it had to be, I mean, way beyond what we are now, of course. Um, and just to be taught by God personally of the things, you know, there must have been so many things, I mean, Creation, the garden that he was put in, the garden in itself had to be something just amazingly beautiful. I mean, we look at creation today marred by sin the way that it is, and we still see a lot of beauty in it. I can't imagine what the garden looked like. Can't even begin to really imagine what it looks like, even though the Bible tells us. But so some of the things that God created, Genesis 1 and 2. Um, let me just see what I could pull from the lesson here real quick. Genesis 1 recounts the creation week and growing wonder of the earth as it is given form and then life. Um, first we learn of the powerful artistic creator who has an eye for perfect beauty. Then we meet the God of relationships who wants humanity to love and care for each other and the rest of creation. So pretty much says it all back to the thing about uh, God and fellowship. So fellowship with God and fellowship with man. Um, 
Uh, let me just ask a vague question. It's kind of vague, but it really isn't. What really is, we'll just get right to it, what really is the purpose of God giving us this day? What is the real purpose of God giving us the Sabbath? Um, okay, uh, I will go ahead, brother. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, interesting enough, you know, during the time of the Israelites, it all came down to the Sabbath, whether they were going to be spared or, you know, uh, we'll look at that verse, uh, I think, in uh, uh Tuesday's lesson. Um, yeah, let's just take a look at it real quick. I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, okay, it's, it'll come up as we go into the lesson, but it was a determining factor to the fate of Jerusalem. Whether they would be, you know, God said that they would be a nation forever if they obeyed and kept God's statutes, particularly the Sabbath day. But if they didn't keep it, judgment was going to come on them, and judgment did come on them concerning the Babylonians, right? And it was concerning the Sabbath day. Um, I don't want to get too far off track, and let me just try and finish up with Sunday and see what we can pull from it. Uh, it's a lot to look at as far as, uh, as, far as Genesis 1 and 2. Um, I'm going to read the bottom of the last study. It says, The first Sabbath could not have been a passive experience for Adam and Eve. It was a God-centered opportunity for them to focus on their creator and the created. It was a time for them to be astonished. So, yeah, so once again, you know, we have a time that, you know, everything that God created, I mean, there's, there was so much to really, and really for us today even, but see, we tend to lose focus, I think. You know, we, we take these things for granted. You know, all the things that God has created for us, you know, we just kind of... Uh, another thing for the Sabbath, I think, uh, that would be a good thing is, uh, you know, sometimes we go on nature walks or we go out, you know, somewhere in nature and we get to see God's creation. And uh, I think it's really a, a neat thing. I mean, when we take time out and we can... I've said this before, just see things and see the character of God and the beauty of the things that He's given us and how good God is. I mean, from even the smallest things, it's the food that he provides for us, you know, that we might take for granted. Um, so yeah, it's a time for us to, God wants to bring us back once a week because just like sheep, you know, we tend to wander, right? So as the week goes on, we tend to wander away from God. And if we stay too uh, disconnected from God for too long, then we know that's not a good thing. I mean, and, that, and we can easily fall into that trap. And that's the beauty, and that's what I love about the Adventist faith is that once a week, every week, we have this one day, this one opportunity to come and focus on God, worshiping Him, spending time with each other, and doing the things that God would have us doing. Um, okay, any comments or questions so far? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Amen. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I know some people that work seven days a week, they never have any rest, and they're just miserable, you know, and what a blessing God gives us a day of rest. Um, so back to, you know, 
things that are permissible, things that aren't permissible to do on the Sabbath. Um, what exactly is the rest? I mean, are we just to, you know, take a day off and just relax all day at home and sleep and just really get rest? You know, I look, I've, I've, uh, there's a, a particular point in, uh, in the three angels' message that always has had stood out to me for a long time. And uh, it, it, the word rest comes up. You know, when it talks about those that worship the beast, it says that they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image. And I heard a pastor saying uh, from another faith on the radio one day, he says, see, there you go. They are in hell burning forever. They have no rest day or night. And so it just totally threw me a loop because I knew that wasn't the truth. And I said, well, I need to find out and get to the real bottom of what this rest thing means. What it means. Well, what, what, is, what is the word rest in, in Hebrew? What is it? It's Shabbat. Shabbat. And so back to Sabbath. Back to rest. So the ones that aren't getting the rest are the ones that aren't keeping the Sabbath day holy. And it's true because when you read the three angels' message, it, it's speaking of two camps. Those that keep the commandments of God and those that worship the beast in the beast image. And one has the rest. The others don't have the rest. Okay, anyway, I hope I didn't get off topic there, but... Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. So we come to church on Sabbath to get recharged. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Hmm. Good point. Yeah, that. Yeah, and that's a really good uh, observation, also. You know, so, and I think about that too personally. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in work that we tend to lose focus of being grounded in God's word. So, yeah, I mean, great uh, Sabbath every week. We come back. But the truth is, is that during the week also, because like you said, at times we'll get so, you know, distracted with everything that we don't have peace in here and in here, right? Yeah, I agree. Hmm, how so? Sanctification that Jesus is providing. 
Yeah, um, brings up a point too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's kind of interesting that you said that though, that in heaven, because it, it's not a determining factor of who his people are because we're already up there in heaven with God, but yet we'll still be keeping the Sabbath, right? As a memorial to God. Yeah, sister. How are we going to know where what? When there would be a weekly Sabbath if there's no night to get rid of it. That's kind of interesting. That's really good point. But, but, but there's a, there's a false hmm. there because okay. from one angle of the Bible says from one new moon to the other, right. we'll be keeping the Sabbath. So right. uh, there must be, as, as we understand it, other planets like the moon and two maybe. I don't know. But there is definition of how we know when to, when, when to gather or go, to go somewhere. Sure. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, good points. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Can, can God give you a blessing if you're not, and historically, this is historical, but can God give you a blessing or will he give you a blessing if you're not keeping his law? Um, I would say no. Yeah. And, and Sister White says, true sanctification is harmony with God, oneness with him in character. It is received through obedience to those principles that are the transcript of his character. Right, right. Um, yeah, and the Bible also tells us that, uh, that the Sabbath is God's way of sanctifying us. The Scripture says that. So another thing that the Sabbath does for us, makes us holy. How so? By continually staying on that path. It allows Christ to intercede and make us holy. Yes, then that's true. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, I saw that you had a comment.
it was like heaven. The, the, rest, the earth is sort of dreamy as a seven day Jesus Christ was dreamy at the time of the incarnation. I don't know if that's what you're getting at. Okay. I, and I was curious because your dad has a history with that or anything. Sure. And then it made sense to me because it says that you know, when it talks about a daily cycle, and then that day it talks about the year and the season of cycles. It doesn't actually say there is no sun or moon. It says there's no moon or sun. Sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, just we, we don't get all of the answers. God gives us what we need. So, yeah. Thank you, brother, for sharing your comment. Uh, go ahead, sister. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, okay. <laughs> right, yeah, I know. I remember David Asherick saying, uh, you know, when he talked about sleep, uh, it's not a, he was talking about death, you know. He was personally, he goes, I like, I love to sleep. I mean, yeah, uh, we all do. I mean, Part of, it's part of our whole recharging, right? Um, okay, so time for rediscovery. Monday's lesson, boy, we're barely, it's okay though. Um, so when Moses is asked to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, it's clear that the masses have lost their, sp their perspective as children of God. I'm just going to read the, the beginning part. They need to rediscover who the God is who asks for their worship and gives them so many uh, promises of an amazing future. The Sabbath is a pivotal learning experience in their journey of rediscovery. Uh, it also becomes a clear signal to other nations of the special relationship between God and this nation. The experience of the manna epitomizes God's way of educating the Israelites. So, yeah, um, that was also one of the other things that, that God did with his people with the Sabbath. He was showing them uh, who, who it was that these people worshipped, who the God of Israel was. And uh, it was a sign that for God, it, it's saying that these are my people. Look, they keep this special day. This is how you recognize them. and They're separated from everybody else, Right. And it's still that way today, isn't it? I mean, there aren't very many groups of people that keep the seventh-day Sabbath, right? When we look at all the Christian world, most of the Christian world keeps Sunday, you know? So we are set apart in that way. And, and what's the word holy? Set apart, right? So, yeah, that was one of the other things. Um, and, of course, you know, God had to bring the chil children of Israel. We're looking at Exodus uh, 16, 14 through 29. Uh, we're just briefly going to look at it. Um, so it mentions the manna. So have you ever really considered the manna also being something that God gave as a sign of the Sabbath day? Um, so I'm just going to look at 17 just briefly and, and just read from there. It says, So the children of Israel did so gather some more, some less, so when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's needs. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stink. So the manna is a representation of what? The bread, the bread of life, it's a representation of Jesus, right? So, remember Jesus said he was the manna that came down from heaven, didn't he? So, when we see the manna, what's going on here is God is saying, look, I'm going to give you provisions, but only take what you need for today. And we know that on, the, on, on Friday, he would give them a double portion, right? 
so that they wouldn't have to go out. Do you think the Sabbath is important when you think about it in this way, that God is saying, hey, look, I don't even want you to go out there. You know, the manna fell, the Bible says, like snow, like snowflakes, right? And it would even melt afterwards like snow. But so we might take something and think that it's like of such a little importance of going out and, hey, I'm just going to, you know, get this manna and bring it in. But God said, no, you're not going to do that on the Sabbath day. I don't want you going out there and doing that. He even says that he didn't even want them leaving there. Uh, 27, 20, uh, 29 says, you know, it says, uh, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So when you think about the Israelites where they were during that time, during the Exodus, you know, they, uh, they would be camped about. They'd have their places and God is basically saying, you know, don't go out of the camp or anyway. Um, so, yeah, this is how important the Sabbath is to God. Um, and he wants us to take this day serious. And I know it, it can be difficult at times. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to read the comment at the bottom because I just want to talk about this for a second. Uh, so, you know, imagine it says taking a teenager who's finding the Sabbath boring, he's keeping it only because that's what the Bible says and his parents say he must do so. Um, I personally have been there. My mom didn't become an Adventist until I was about 17 years of age. So imagine the time being a teenager that's brought up in the world, not in Christianity, and now all of a sudden, you know, my mom's saying, oh, you know, you're not going out on Friday night. You're staying home. <laughs> and in the morning, you're going to wake up early and you're going to go to church. So imagine how that would feel to somebody who's used to going out on Friday night, right? Sleeping in on, on Saturday morning. But now I've got these things that I have to do. How does the Sabbath, the Bible tells us that the Sabbath, he says, God says that he wants it to be a delight to us, to delight in the Sabbath. How do we delight in the Sabbath? How do we take something that seemingly, and by the way, when I read that, I thought, well, you know what? That's, just, that's not just teenage, young teenagers. This is some adults too. It even might be some adults that we have in our church. And I know that at times, you know, I, I struggle still also, you know, with, okay, well, let's see. Do I go home and do I open my Bible? Do I call people up and start witnessing and sharing the word? And all these things, because, you know, we get so caught up in, in, in self. So uh, what would be some of the ways? What would be a way that we could actually make the Sabbath? I know it is, and don't get me wrong, because it is a delight for me. I know that when I get to spend time, you know, even after church is when I go, and I'll just really, like, try and learn something new. And that's the beauty of it, that God always has something new to share with us. And the part... Ooh, most of you can probably agree with me on this, is that I love the history part of it, you know, because God opens up a world that we've never, ever considered before or even thought of. But anybody got a comment on maybe how a, a, a neat way to share with somebody who would be struggling with, you know, coming to church or reading their Bibles or keeping the Sabbath holy? And I know it is a challenge because I know people that have been preached the Sabbath for many years and they agree with it 100%, but yet they still don't keep it holy. So any creative ways maybe somebody could think of a way to get people interested in, in what, it is, what is it that brings us here? Why are you here today? Is it just out of well, because I know I have to be obedient to God. And, and God doesn't want it to be that way for us. He says, I want it to be a delight for you, right? He says, I want you to be happy. I want you to, to what is heaven about? What is this time period about that we're in right now? What is the Sabbath about? It's preparing us for the things to come. If we can't do them now here on earth and be prepared now, how much more difficult is it going to be you know, and God says that it's not for everybody because there would be people that would just be miserable, you know. Go ahead, brother. Comment. Totally overwhelmed, and it's part of the work 
Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the truth of it is, is that Satan has us so jaded and and, and blind um, that because we do get involved in all of these things that aren't holy, let's say. Um, that it becomes the norm for us, and this is what's entertaining. You know, like you said, the entertainment thing. It, it becomes um, a thing that the experience is just so overwhelming that we don't have time to really think about things that might be important. The, so the point I'm trying to make here is that, in reality, the truth is, the things that God has for us are beautiful, amazing, fun, great, but we get it backwards. We think, you know, I saw a presentation uh, a few years back a great uh, DVD series, and it was on this entertainment thing. And But at the end, because uh, I'm just going to get to the point, at the end he was illustrating there was two buffet tables, and I like the, the analogies that he used. You know, there was two tables. One was all these beautiful fruits and vegetables and all this beautiful color, and over here was all, you know, everything that people usually feast on, you know, the junk food, you know, and all of the things that we think are just amazing, right? And he said that most of us feed off of this table. And of course, it's an illustration, right? And we could use the food as a literal thing too. And he says, thinking that this is what is really good, you know, but what's really good is this table over here, right? And we tend to get it backwards. But the truth is, is this table is much better but we tend to go, oh, no, we don't want that. We, we'd rather have this, right? But the more we get in tune with God, the more those things, like Paul said, the things he used to hate, he now loves, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of it is that we're just so, you know, overwhelmed by all the things that Satan throws at us every day. But this is where God says that he wants to give us a day to come back and focus on the good things that God has for us. Sure, sure. Yes. That's right. That's one of my mom's favorite I, scriptures. I, I fall flat on my face. I mean, I, I you know, scrolling through something. Oh, look, he's got the box of, you know, and I'm not trying to be super judgmental on my, my dad or anybody else, but wicked things are very entertaining. That's right. And we're very drawn to them. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our minds, our spirits. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's good when we hear, you know, other people struggling with the same things that we struggle with because then we know we're not alone. Uh, the Sabbath was a way God helped the Israelites rediscover their identity and their God. They were asked to obey and keep the Sabbath holy, but this was in the context of 
developing a deeper understanding of the character of their creator and about building a lasting relationship of promise. So again, good definition. Uh, you know, what does it mean, their identity? God helped the Israelites to rediscover their identity. Who were they? They were supposed to be God's chosen people, right? They were the seed of Abraham, right? That was their identity, that they were worshipers of the true God. Um, okay, so let's move on for the sake of time, unless anybody has a comment. It was really about uh, the heading time for rediscovery, and it was mainly talking about what would happen. Uh, let me just comment before I leave that page also. So, you know, the manna would be kept over. If it was kept over, it would turn to worms. When would the manna come down, by the way? When would God send them the manna? Was it evening, afternoon? When was it? I would assume night, because he was there when he woke up. Um, okay, yeah, okay. So when were they to go out and gather the manna? In the morning, right? Because that was the best. You know, everything with God, it always seems that he's always done early in the morning. And same thing, God is showing us an illustration of, okay, the bread is representing what again? It's the word of God, right? So do you think God wants us to seek him early in the morning? Because what ends up happening, as we talked about, is we go out th throughout our day, and all these things come at us, so by the end of the day, you know, we might not have time for God. Or if we do, like you said, we're going to be all jumbled up from all of this other stuff. How do we find the peace to be able to focus on God's word? So this is why God says, no, in the morning, seek me in the morning, right? And I know that's when we wake up, that our minds are fresh, you know, our abilities. You know, I do artwork, and I know that when I've got a good rest, I'm able to paint better than I would normally. So that's the illustration God has given us with that, with the morning, is to seek him in the morning, to seek his word early in the morning. Um, Tuesday, time for learning priorities. Okay, so uh, we're looking at Jeremiah 17, 19 through 27. Um, Hallow the Sabbath day. Um, we don't have time to read it all, obviously. There's a lot of scriptures here today. Um, but uh, so it says, 23 says, but they did not obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. I'm going to read 24 also. It shall be if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day, do no work in it, then shall enter the gates of the city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they are their princes accompanied by men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. So like I, as I mentioned earlier, that verse is, you know, what it's speaking of during that time, of course. Babylon was sitting right outside the gates ready to, uh, they actually besieged them three times, and the third time they utterly destroyed the city. But God was telling them that if they obeyed and kept his statutes, his charges, that they would be blessed and that they would be restored back to their original. Remember, at one point they were a kingdom, a great kingdom, right? A great nation. And God said that if you do these things, and, and, and one of the main things was the Sabbath. He says that, you know, your kings will be here forever. The city will be here forever. But they didn't obey, did they? And we know what ended up ultimately happening because of it. Disobedience to God. I mean, there's always... There's always a price to be paid for sin. I don't care what the sin is. I know this personally, truly. You know, we think that we can do things and disobey God. We might think that even the Sabbath isn't that big of a deal if we're breaking the Sabbath. But everything that God gives us is a big deal. Because God says that even the smallest sin, you're going to have to pay for that one way or another. And it might not be today or tomorrow. But trust me, eventually, every sin is accounted for. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, he gave them more than amount. Uh, he gave them more than. Uh, God provides a miracle of the manner. Uh, no, sorry, I'm on the wrong day. I apologize. I'm back to the man. <laughs> okay, so oh, my page turned. I apologize. 
Okay, so we looked at Jeremiah 17. I'm going to uh, also read 27 just briefly. Uh, here's the warning. It says, But if you will not heed me to hollow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when you, enter, when you are entering the gates in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kinder a file in it, fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Um, so that is what ended up happening. Uh, the city burned. Uh, when, when the Bible says quenched, uh, I think most of us are pretty clear on what that means, right? It doesn't mean that it won't be put out. It just means that it's going to burn until it's done burning. You know, nobody's going to come and put the fire out. It doesn't mean that it burns forever. Some people think that when the Bible says forever, it's just for a time. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit from the bottom just briefly. Sabbath is about delighting in learning the character and purposes of God and then living that character and those purposes in our relationships to others. I think that pretty much sums it up right there. So the Sabbath is about obedience, right? It's about showing loyalty to the Creator. It's showing Him who we are as a people. And it's not just about, as the lesson study is telling us, it's not just about doing the, or, or going through these motions because sometimes People will tend to go through the motions, you know, well, I have to go to church, I have to read my Bible, I have to pray, right? I don't like that wording, have to, because God doesn't make us do anything. But yet, that's how we get caught up in these things sometimes. We think that, oh, if I keep the Sabbath, I'm going to go to heaven if I read my Bible, right? If we do these things, um, yes, God wants obedience, but at the same time, he doesn't want forced obedience, right? He wants it to be something that we do to show our loyalty to him. And so this is what the Sabbath is all about. And, as it said, our relationship to others. So we get together and we come together as a church, as uh, people that are like-minded in their beliefs for the most part. But it's once again, like I said, the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments, right? And once again, the Ten Commandments are what? One tablet is all about God right, and how we honor God, and the other six are our relationship to man, right? Again, what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're not going to be all by ourselves in heaven, right? We're going to be with people, and that's what's always funny to me is that, you know, people will say that the thing that they don't like is people, and, and it's especially, and I don't mean funny, ha-ha funny, but it's especially funny when Christians say that, because that is not how God would have us. God says, no. He says, I want you to be about people. Remember, he told the disciples, I want you to be fisher of men, right? And he also gives us a Sabbath for that reason, that we come together and we learn how to fellowship together, you know, have meals together. Families today don't even really eat together most of the time, but this is what God is doing with the Sabbath. He's bringing us together for obedience and, and uh, to grow in his word and the understanding of who he is. God wants us to fully understand who he is. Why? What happened in heaven? What, what caused the fall? It was a misunderstanding of God's character, wasn't it? So how important is it that we come on the Sabbath day and learn about God and study his word? Um, okay. Any comments? Because I know I'm just over here just uh, talking, but uh, I, I would like some feedback if you guys have some. Uh, so Wednesday's lesson, time for finding balance. Um, so I, I have highlighted here, it says, the scribes and the Pharisees knew the letter of the law. However, Jesus went much further in his Sabbath day, educating of his followers. Um, so we know a lot about the, you know, we had two different sects. We had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? But during the time when Jesus came, you know, the Bible says that Jesus came at a time, at an opportune time, the right time, because at that time, his people were in such a spiritual decline or decay that they had gotten everything wrong 
about the Sabbath, right? They had put all these burdens on people. They said you couldn't do certain things. Um, and, and they had so many ridiculous laws concerning the Sabbath, and God never said it, most of those things. I mean, I get why they did it, but yet they had gotten it all wrong. And Jesus came, and one of the things that he teached a lot about was the Sabbath because they had gotten it so, so backwards and wrong, right? Um, Matthew 12, 1 through 13. Let's just briefly take a look at that. If, if you're not there, uh, uh, yeah, I just encourage you just to follow along if, if you would. Um, so Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Back to the memory text, right? Um, it says that, uh, this, therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So just in general, the Sabbath was made just for the Jews and for Adventists, right? <laughs> okay, so just briefly, I'm just going to put, put it out there with where, uh, where I was going with it. So it says, uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What is, what is God, what is Jesus saying there in that? What exactly does that mean, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath? Because remember, the issue prior to that, we don't have time to look at it all, but Jesus was getting called out because the Pharisees were on the Sabbath, picking grain, you know, they're just putting it in their hand and eating it, right? Um, so Jesus tells them, you know, he, he's reminding them. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Well, which was first? The Sabbath was created first or man was created first? Well, yeah, I mean, on the creation day in Genesis... Yeah, so on creation, and this is what Jesus is referring to. He's saying, look, the Sabbath wasn't made first and then man for the Sabbath. It's the other way around. And by the, word, by the way, that word man, anthropos, right, in Greek means what? It means mankind. So it means what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, this is not just for you guys, but for everybody, Right? Jew and non-Jew alike. It's for everybody. This is what Jesus was saying. So, you know, the part that gets me, though, is when, when, when we read, um, and it tells us, uh, I was trying to find the scripture there, kind of lost it for a second, but um, Jesus goes on and he tells them, he tells them about David when his men went into the temple and ate the bread, Right? And how was that okay that they could go in there and eat the bread that was for the priest only? And he said, you know, they were, even, even the priests profaned the Sabbath. How were the priests profaning the Sabbath? What kind of work? <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, and when they were working, they were working. I mean, think of what it would take to keep which, by the way, they kept that fire going continually on that altar. And how much work do you think it takes to put an animal, to sacrifice an animal? So they're doing these things on the Sabbath. They're working, right? But Jesus is saying, look, it's acceptable. There are things that are acceptable, you know? And back to that question of what is acceptable on the Sabbath and what isn't. Go ahead, brother. And it's just a vague question I'm just throwing out there. That's right. That was the law. That's right. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm Lord of the Sabbath and love takes precedence over law. Amen. And that's just uh, what was in essence the problem, you know. Every time you see Jesus' disciples on Sabbath, it's a very relaxed atmosphere. There's no tension about what am I doing right now? It's just like right, that. right. And, uh, you know, Jesus tried to clarify, love your, your love neighbor, do good on the Sabbath. And so for him, Sabbath is a relationship thing uh, with the master. It's a special time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't. We don't want to get. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Okay, uh, so let me just, uh, I just want to uh, just finish this by reading uh, Friday's further thought, and I'm just going to read through it and end, end it with that. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. So as I mentioned before, that was how God was showing who his people were. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith, they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the commandment was given to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Lord said to them, Ye shall be holy men unto me. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshipers of God. Then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. There you have it. So, once again, it's a day for us to come together and it's a way of God sanctifying us um, and also a way of separating us from the world. You know, when it said early on, separation from idolatry. Remember, idolatry can be anything. It doesn't just mean bowing down to a golden calf, does it? Okay, I'm going to end it with that. Uh, thanks for your participation class. I'm just going to have a quick word of prayer for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful once again for the time that we're able to spend in coming and communing on your special day, our special day, Father, that you give us a day of rest and a day of fellowship and a day of worshiping you, Father, the creator of the universe and the creator of us, Father, and all that's in this world, Father. Uh, we just want to thank you once again, Father, for giving us these opportunity to be called children of God and uh, to be a, a people who have a sign, Father, that shows us who our commitment is to. Father, I just pray for our uh, pastor today as he goes into the sermon I pray for uh, all of the church services to be blessed Father and once again I just pray that uh, our Lord and Savior will be lifted up through it all in Jesus name I pray Amen, Amen. Alright